Welcome to this webinar. I'm Harvey Richardson. I work for the uh, Archer Center of Excellence. Uh, the idea of this talk is basically to discuss uh, software updates uh, on the Archer system. And there are two kinds of updates that I want to cover. I initially, uh, a brief introduction to the, the updates of the operating system. That's very quick. And then the main aim is to concentrate on the programming environment. So these are things like compilers, the MPI installation, and the libraries. And I'll go through some of those updates and describe what features came in with those updates. Some of those are relevant for performance. Some are new features that give a new functionality. And some apply to standards. For example, uh, you might get a, an implementation of a, a new API or a new variant of that API, like OpenMP 4.5. So the first thing is to talk about the, the operating system. So the Cray Linux environment, which is installed on the compute nodes and the login nodes and the mom nodes, which are where your job runs, that's upgraded from time to time. And this comprises the, the basic OS. So that's the SUSE OS distribution, along with some other layers. So for example, libraries, drivers, drivers for things like the Ares network, uh, Luster components and, uh, and other things. And on top of that sits the programming environment. And th this is upgraded fairly infrequently. Uh, so you can see that there have been updates in 2014, 2015, and 2017. And we're currently on Sealy 5.2 update 4 for the main system. And, and those updates can introduce new hardware support uh, for, a, for a system that isn't changing much. That's not really relevant. But you may have access to Cray systems uh, in other places that might have GPUs, for example, or different types of processors. So, so those features come in with, with these kinds of updates. The other things you sometimes get are updates to things like ALPS. So the feature to bind an application to a set of CPUs based on the number of threads you said you were going to use was one feature that came in with a CLE update. Other features might be things like support for SSDs. Uh, and I should have a quick note to say that the KNL nodes actually run a more recent version of CLE. So they run CLE 6 update 1. So there are some slight differences there. And in, in the subsequent talk, there are a few cases where the program environment offers new functionality that's only available on CLE 6. So it would only be available on those KNL nodes, but not yet on the main system. But I'll highlight those when it comes to them. So. Uh, if we if we begin to think more about the programming environment side, and, and I know this slide is a bit difficult to, to view, uh, you have a range of programming languages. So clearly, you have support for Fortran, C, C++, Cray provides Chapel, uh, and, and there are Python and R packages with the CLE6 environment. All of this is controlled by a set of modules. And so we have a combination of modules that you can load and particular programming environment modules, for example, the Cray one, the GNU one, and uh, potentially ones for Intel and PGI uh, that, that, that then give you a consistent set of the other software. So if you have the Cray module loaded, you'll get Cray compilers, and you'll get libraries that will link with the Cray compilers, and you'll get an MPI that will work with the Cray compilers. So, so you, and you also have shared memory programming with OpenMP, global arrays. You have uh, the PGAS languages like UPC, Fortran co arrays. Those are Cray version of co -array C++ available as well. Uh, you have uh, software from other ISVs or other open source or open source projects like the GNU compilers, uh, a range of scientific libraries like LAPEX, LAPEX, Scalar Pack, uh, more specialist things like FFTs, then I/O targeted libraries like NetCDF and HDF5, and development tools so things like third-party debuggers. Uh, this slide mentions something called GDB for HPC. That's actually the LGDB debugger. I think marketing people decided to rename it. So that's quite a new name that you probably haven't heard of before. And then a couple of uh, debugging utilities, abnormal terminating processing ATP, which catches your application if it fails and gives you a stack trace. And then STAT, which will enable you to stop an application and get a stack trace of where it is, even if it's failed on you know, 2,000 nodes, you can learn what's happening. Then we have performance tools. Uh, and, and then some other things like Reveal, which is an application to help scope loops for OpenMP, a comparative debugger. And there are some new things coming along with kind of deep learning uh, optimizations, uh, which aren't really appropriate for Archer. So I'm really going to concentrate on a small piece of this puzzle, the Cray-specific parts, particularly the changes in compilers. I'm going to talk a bit about changes in message passing and a bit about tools at the end. But the idea is to give you a feel for the kind of updates that have happened over, say, the last year and a half. Uh, 
so that I'll explain what's just changed with the current set that was installed on Archer and what's about to change with the next program environment that's installed. So, so I've already mentioned the scope of the program environment. The, the, the updates are released by Cray sometimes once a month or a bit less frequent than that, but they're not all installed. So generally, a few months will go by and then an update will be installed on Archer that will update, for example, compilers or MPI or the associated libraries. Uh, and, and, and then there's a separate decision as to whether those updates become a default or not. And that would happen after some testing. Uh, and, and it probably isn't that obvious when this happens, but if we look back over the last few years, there, there was a, a release in January 2015 that was installed the same month, actually, uh, and it became a default in April of that year. In November 2015, there was a release that was installed in December, and the module defaults were initially scheduled for February, but eventually happened in March. And then the current environment was installed in May. Uh, Sorry, it was the, the programming environment from May. It was released in May, but it was installed on the system in July, and then it became the default in August. And the most recent programming environment version, which is December 2017, was installed in March. Now, that's not currently the default, so you need to do something if you want to use, say, the newer compiler or the newer MPI that's in those in that specific release, and I'll, I'll mention how you would do that. And I've not mentioned intermediate releases that were made available on the system, which you could switch to, uh, but th that didn't eventually become a default. So there were a whole range in between here that I've not uh, described. So, so if you want to use some component from a release that's been installed, like I said, that, that currently isn't default, you can do that by switching modules. So if you want to switch versions, say, w within a major compiler release. So imagine that your current default is that you've got the 8.5.0 compiler and you want to switch to 8.5.8. You can just say module switch CCE into CCE 8.5.8. But just be aware that if you're switching major versions, you might have to switch more than one uh, module. So you might have to switch compiler and potentially switch MPI and perhaps libsci at the same time so that you have a, a compatible set of an, an environment that's compatible. Uh, and that and that can be an issue. For example, major releases might have some incompatibility, say with say Fortran modules. So if you have something that was originally built with one compiler, those might not be compatible with a newer compiler or the other way around. So there there may be some subtleties when you're trying to do that. So and one thing that's quite useful to know is that there's there's a meta module called CDT. And CDT stands for Cray Development Toolkit. It's more of a term the admins use for the packaging of the installation. So today, if you want to switch to the latest installed release, you say you can say module load CDT slash 17.12, and that will switch about six modules. It will switch compiler, MPI, libsci, uh, in a way that gives you a compatible set. If you, if you don't do that, you'll get warnings when you attempt to use the compiler. And I'll explain later on why there was actually a change that happened with the 8.6 compiler that made it incompatible with some earlier releases. So quite often, you don't have to switch as many things. But just be aware, if you want to try that compiler, it's not as simple as just doing a module switch to CCE 8.6.5. It's better to use this special module that does multiple switches for you. So although I'm really going to concentrate on just the Cray-specific parts of the environment in the rest of this talk, of course, there are, there are other pieces of software that are installed. So there are versions of the Intel compiler starting at 14, going up to 17. And the, and the current default is 17.00098. There are versions of the GNU compiler ranging from 4.8 to 7.2. The current default is 6.3.0. And I need to be a little bit careful about what I mean by that. So if you log on to Archer, the GCC you would get without doing anything would be the system supplied one, which is quite old. But if you need a GCC module to be compatible with the program environment, because either you load the GCC module itself, or you've loaded ProgEnv GNU to get a GNU environment, you'll get 6.3.0. And that's much newer than the system GCC. The system GCC is there really for people who need to build you know, developer software that's potentially compatible with the kernel. You know, it's, it's what was installed with SUSE. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm going to just concentrate on the rest of this on the Cray developed parts of the PE. Uh, 
and, and, and to add to the kind of developer story, EPCC make many other packages available, either support packages for builds or in particular pre-compiled applications. And the Archer website mentions you know, the range of applications that, that are available on Archer. So, so in, in, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to start to get much, much more specific. So I've collected a lot of information together, and sometimes it's, it's really bitty, precise detail about what a particular version included. And, and that may be of uninteresting to a lot of people. If you're the kind of person who really cares about what new feature there is in the compiler and potentially what change of compiler flags or the meaning of those flags might have happened because you, you test an application and you want to get the absolute best performance out of it. You have an understanding of what all the flags mean. And you might be concerned that some change might make, for example, computation a bit less accurate. Then that information will be in the rest of this talk. I'll also talk about the the changes that have happened in MPI. There's been quite a lot of nice optimizations done on MPI. And I'll mention something about debugging and performance tools at the end. And, and I realize that there's a lot of small bits of information in this talk. The, the webinar will be available online. And, and if you contact the help desk, I'm happy to send an Archer user a PDF of the talk, because I think there's quite a lot of kind of reference type information there that would be useful to dip into in the future. Uh, at the moment, it's really a case of spotting you know, what particular features might be of interest to you to know, you know that the have appeared in the last few releases or are about to appear. So, so I guess the next question is, what, why would you care? Right? What, what might a new updated programming environment get you or a new update to a package? Well, well you can expect new support for APIs or standards. So you know, languages move along all the time. So for C, C++, and Fortran, there are standards that drive those languages. And on, a, on the, the scale of a few years, those things change from time to time. So the, comp the developer software tracks those changes, usually after some delay. You also have API updates. So for example, MPI gradually changes. OpenMP changes. So we're now at OpenMP 4.5. Something like Shemem really moved by into tracking the, uh, the Open Shemem effort. So there's been some updates to that. The other thing that happens is new features are, are provided, uh, and per perhaps those features came f could have come from a request from the Archer community. So some examples in the past would be trace sites have asked for a bit reproducibility options for compilations, so that if you compile an application and you run it with a varying number of threads or MPI processes, you get precisely the same result. That's quite important to the weather community for testing. So that's an example of a feature that was requested that was delivered in a PE update of a compiler. Another request was to initialize variables to NANs. So that means if, you've, if, if you compute on a NAN and you set trapping, your program immediately stops. So that's quite a nice debugging tool. Another feature was the ability to label the output from an individual process. So those are, those are just a few examples of the kind of thing that have come in from customer requirements. And then the other big thing that's a bit invisible is performance improvement. And that might be performance of how, of how quickly a component operates, like a compiler, or it might be performance of generated code, or it might be performance of a library. Uh, so th those improvements generally happen all the time in, in behind the scenes. And, and then new platform support. You know, For an existing system, you probably don't notice that. But Archer has a few KNL nodes. So, so at one point, the developers had to start targeting KNL. They're always targeting new processors that come out. So, you know, we have Ivy Bridge on Archer, but there's been a few generations of Intel processors since then. And then, of course, there are bug fixes. So I think the latest program environment installed fixed at least three bugs that I submitted that, were, that came from Archer users. So that's the other thing that you gain from the, from the updates. Uh, <clears throat> so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to kind of go through components of the environment and mention what, what was different, what came in with an update, what new features came in, what support came in. And I'm going to start with the oldest one. So, so the current default Cray compiler is 858. That's what you'd currently get. Uh, and the situation before we got to 858 was we had a compiler that supported C99. It supported it could support C++11, but the default was C++03. Cray compilers have supported Fortran 2008 for a long time. I think 2012. So that's kind of a given. And OpenMP4. So so that's where we were before we got CC8.5. So when CC8.5 came out, like I said, language support and standard support is one thing that quite often you get in new releases. So C11 uh, was supported. 
Uh, device features were added for OpenMP 4.5. Uh, that's not relevant for Archer because there are no GPUs. Uh, the the in implementation of OpenMP changed to be compatible with GNU. So that's quite useful because it means you could mix GNU compiled objects with CCE compiled objects and have them both use the same OpenMP implementation or be a, or a compatible OpenMP implementation. So that's a sort of interoperability story. Uh, KNL support was added at this point. So, so this is a combination of support in the whole program environment as well as the compiler uh, and specifically it was support for the particular AVX instructions you have with with KNL uh, and also a, a feature that enables you to target memory so you can specifically target MCD RAM by saying which variables in your application want to live in which memory and I'll mention that later on actually oh, I've got a slide on that uh, a range of performance improvements uh, uh, the next one is, is is not of interest to Archer, but Cray also has cluster systems as well as the XC range, and the, and the compiler on the cluster systems also supports the PGAS languages. Uh, it, it, by functional support, it means it's not absolutely tuned for performance. This thing, I think, is based on LibFabric and, and not Aries. Uh, and then another small change was that there's a pr there are various pragmas that you can put in an application or directives. If you type man directives, you'll see the whole list of them. And there was an optimized pragma that wasn't allowed for C and C++. So that was a small change for people who want to control optimization on a functional level within a source file. So, so that was a quick summary of 8.5. So CCE 8.6. So that's something you can get, like I said, by switching this CDT module. So th this compiler you could try out if you want to. Uh, so it's now moved C++ to C++ uh, 14. Uh, and it is the default now. For C, the default is now C11. It was C99. And this is quite an important point. It's not obvious from this, but the, the, the actual C and C++ compilers rely on a fair amount of infrastructure from GCC. So some of the libraries come from a GCC implementation, as do some of the header files. And the basis for that moved from an older version of GCC to GCC 6.1. So that brings along with it changes that include files and in fact support for newer versions of the language standards and it, it brings in more efficiencies from those libraries but there is some incompatibility there so that 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 change actually was the thing that caused an incompatibility with various other bits of cray software and that's why when you use the 8.6 compiler you pretty, you need to switch other modules at the same time so full open mp 4.5 support and i've got a slide mentioning what was new with open mp 4.5 there was some work to improve the performance of UPC. The G option has changed in what it means and how it behaves. So I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so, and that's one to be aware of because it changed the default behavior and, optim and potentially the optimization of an existing make file. And there's a new option which allows you to control uh, the interpretation, if you like, of or the optimization potential of a given source file based on the type of aliasing you might see in that source file. So aliasing is not a problem for Fortran because of the way the language is defined, but, but for C, you have potential aliasing that can inhibit optimizations. And this flag gives a bit more finer control over that than, than previously available. Uh, so as I said, hardware support is one thing that changes, not really relevant for Archer, but this, this release supports Skylake. Uh, it also uses approximations by default. So what this means is that there are hardware instructions that approximate inverse and square root, and the compiler will use those, but there's a loss of accuracy. So it does it at a higher level optimization, but the, the, the point it's done that has been, has been slightly changed. So you, you could have an existing application that's now going to use approximations that it wasn't doing before. So this would be relevant to someone who was, who'd really pinned down precise optimization flags in the compiler to get extreme accuracy for some iterative solver, for example and that might change slightly, so it's something to watch. The other thing which I'll mention in a sec is, is that the implementation of throw catch changed to give it a much better performance. Also improved vectorization of Fortran array syntax uh, and impro improvements for pure compilation time. It, the C++ compiler has been really slow at compilation. I mean, I have to admit that. So if you try to compile something like the XIOS server that's used by the weather community, it's very slow. 
I mean, it could be 10 times slower than some other compilers. And they made the dramatic improvements in the performance of that. Because really, they they basically targeted optimization without any attention to how long, how expensive that was in computation time. Uh, so so that, that's been a, a huge improvement. So if you've avoided using that compiler because of compilation time, it might be worth giving 8.6 to go. And there actually was a recent query on this. So I know it's been an issue for some people. And, and this is just to reiterate that, that that change with the infrastructure, the GNU infrastructure, uh, and the fact that the default language is, has changed means that you, there could be some incompatibility. So you might find some source code that's interpreted differently, or that the new language standard doesn't allow you to do something you did before. That's quite unlikely, but it's potentially possible that you might come across something like that for a, a large C++ application. And in general, th these changes are made for various reasons. A change because the language standard has moved on is clearly something that's positive. Some other changes are there because the Cray compiler developers want to be compatible in performance with other compilers for similar optimization flag choices. So they tend to make little changes because they think users who use default flags are getting a different behavior and another compiler might be faster. So they change the level of optimization you get, say, for O2. So there's a range of reasons why they do that. Uh, so, so just to mention those those flags again. So the actual flag that controls the hardware approximations uh, for for inverse and for square root is called a prox and no approx. So the Cray compiler has a range of optimization flags that are either extremely specific or generic. So O1, O2, O3 are generic, but but there are other flags that control scalar optimization and floating point optimization. So HFP2 says floating point optimization level two, so bigger number the more optimized you get, and and no approx is a qualifier to that, which says don't use those hardware approximations. Equally, there are flags that enable you to choose the language standard. Uh, so in this case, you can change the standard back to C plus plus O3, but be aware that because some of those header files changed, you know, it's, it's not exactly identical to using the earlier compiler. And so the, and the main point here about dash G is obviously dash G completely disabled optimization, no matter what the other flags were. And you got a warning about that in the build. Uh, now dash G will, it will lose against an optimization flag. So if you say dash G and then O2, you'll get the optimization. Okay, so I, and I mentioned exceptions. So, the, the developers noticed that C++, pro, C++ programmers are now using catch throw blocks in a context that needs performance. So before, this might be something like your I.O. operation failed. But now it's used in a case where, the, where there were examples where the implementation was quite expensive. So they've actually changed the way this has been implemented. So it's much, much faster than it was before. And because, and this is another reason that 8.6 has become incompatible with 8.5 is because of that implementation. So if you mix binaries between the two compilers, you'll find runtime routines that don't match, or you'll get strange error messages. Uh, and the new implementation is also compatible with G++, which means that you can you get object file interchangeability between C, uh, you know, Cray C++ and G++. Um, so so that's one to be aware of. So, so the other one that's 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 is a kind of continuous moving target for the compilers, which is that various processors have they clearly have hardware instructions, so they have assembler routines for those instructions, and there is a way to almost directly call those assemblers by intrinsics, and some applications do this like Gromax, but there's a huge number of these intrinsics, so. Any new platform like ARM, for example, or KNL, it takes the compiler developers quite some time to catch up with the set of intrinsics because it's just a huge task to do it. I mean, here it's noted that for AVX 512, there's more than 5,000 inline intrinsics that you could implement. So, and they do this on a case by case basis. So, a major application like Gromax, they'll support. But if, if people actually require particular intrinsics because they're hard coding some really precise tight kernels that need to be really, really quick. Uh, that they will look at implementing those. Uh, so a, you just put in an RFE to do that, or I can do it for people if they're interested. Uh, and, and there are the various syntax of how you actually call those intrinsic. So there's a GNU syntax and an Intel syntax, and, and both of those are recognized. So, so the other change that came in was to support more OpenMP 4.5 features. 
and I'm not going to basically talk about all of these. If you're interested in OpenMP, you may or may not have heard of these. I'll mention the first two because I thought those were interesting. Um, and being able to inquire of your affinity, I guess, is interesting. So the first one is task loop. And this basically allows you to take a, a loop. So you have a parallel thread team and then to parallelize a loop by tasks. And, and, and the way you do this is you can add clauses that come from either the work share or the task constructs. And in some sense, this is just a convenient way to use tasks to break up a loop. So you could have a complex loop structure and want to use tasks to, to implement that rather than dividing the loop structure into chunks and doing some work share uh, approach. So in a way, it's a convenient way to do that because otherwise you'd have to pass loop indexes into the task. Uh, uh, potentially, it gives you load balance because when this when this runs, and if you have any work left over, if there's a free thread, it can just run another task. And, and that potentially might be more flexible than decomposing the loop in another way. And as mentioned at the end, arbitrary nesting apply, can, uh, can, can apply here. So this is what this looks like. You say pragma OMP task loop, and, I, and I've only put the directive here, that, sorry, the clause here that names the number of tasks. You can both name the, the chunk size in the iteration space, or you can name the number of tasks. So here, solve subset might take a different amount of time based on what I is. Uh, and, and, and that's a silly example, but you can imagine much more complicated examples uh, like the next slide. So here you have a parallel do, and then an inner loop that's decomposed as a, as a, into a set of tasks. And, and, it's, and here, the, it's quite imbalanced or likely to be imbalanced. So uh, it's a possibility that that might be something that a task-based approach is, is more efficient at than you trying to do this by crafting some tasks based on the loop indexes and then de having decomposed uh, that loop to a team of threads. So I thought that was that was kind of an interesting one. And then the other one is 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 what are called do across loops. Now do across is a term, you know, kind of from the old days of parallel computing, going back to the 80s. You know, so so the idea here is that you have a loop that has a cross iteration dependency, and OpenMP already had the way to do this with a generic ordered uh, directive, and the ordered directive basically said. If you've decomposed a loop and you come across an order directive, the enclosed code has to operate, has to be executed in order of those loop iterations, which effectively destroys the parallelism because either the one thread will have to do it or they'll all have to wait for the previous one. So, so this mechanism extends the, the order directive to allow you to specify precisely what those dependencies are. So, so you can imagine that potentially you might have some n-dimensional object with a dependency in one dimension, and you've got the ability to work on a whole face and then wait until you move on to the next one. Uh, and then you could have a whole thread team waiting uh, for a previous complete computation to happen. So it's a much more flexible thing. The onus appears to have been placed on the compiler, though, to decide the appropriate thing to do here to gain performance. So it's just a new feature that you know may or may not be useful to people. Uh, and the other one I was going to mention, and so the, these are people who are interested in the KNL nodes on Archer is that CCE provided a way to directly target memory and say where that memory was. So uh, on KNL, you have both DDR, uh, and there's more DDR than MCD RAM. So the MCD RAM has very high bandwidth. Uh, and this and this memory directives allow you basically to specify that the memory should go to either the DDR or the MCD RAM. So, so you can place it before you know an allocator or deallocating a Fortran or a declaration. You can place it before you know, malloc in C or C++, and, and you, the equivalent uh, before the free. And, and the attributes, originally in the older compilers, the first implementation had uh, bandwidth. So bandwidth meant you got MCD RAM, but uh, there's a new uh, attribute now called uh, capacity, uh, and there's also fallback. So the idea of capacity is it targets the DDR, and you might want to do that if you've launched an application using NUMA control, that forces all the memory to be in MCD RAM, then you want to do the opposite, which is potentially move particular objects into DDR, which is kind of the backward use case from the initial implementation. And fallback just means that if you can't do what you want, the allocation won't fail. So without the fallback option, what would happen is you'd fail if you filled up one of those memories. Uh, and, and then the other thing I just want to mention, I don't want to describe this in great detail, is that uh, 
on Archer, you get affinity because the Alps implementation or the OS binds your application when it's run. So there's a whole range of options you can use on the app run command, like dash CC. So you can say bind to a specific list of CPUs, or you can say bind to the set of CPUs defined by my number of threads I'm using, or you can say bind to NUMA region. Uh, the other way to look at this is to use the OpenMP facility to do the binding. And it might be something worth looking at if you're, say, you're using the Intel OpenMP that has helper threads, because that is a thing that's not trivial to get right with Alps binding. So I can let you know that this, this alternative could provide quite a nice portable way to do binding for an OpenMP application uh, as an alternative or, an, or you know, to, to doing the Alps binding. I would personally go for the Alps binding, but in the consequent, in, in, when you have extra threads, that gets quite complicated to handle. So, and the way you do this is you set an OMP places variable and you set OMP proc bind to, to, a, to a set of options. So OMP places basically says, these are the locations that you can place an open MP thread. So those can be either specifically named, you know, as in a CPU ID that you get from the, from the node, or you can say cores or threads or sockets. Uh, and there's an important thing on this slide, which is that for the Cray implementation, the interpretation of the binding is within the set of, uh, sorry, it's within the affinity that you were given when you were launched. So your process gets launched by Alps, and the the, CC, the binding you got from Alps might have constrained you to a socket, say, or it might have constrained you to eight hardware threads. So for the Cray implementation, OMP places exists within that context. So you can't escape that context. And that's one thing that wasn't defined by OpenMP. So you just have to be careful that another implementation has that same meaning. Uh, so and, and the other thing you have to do is you have to set OMP proc bind. So here you can say, I want you to bind, and I want you to bind to those set of places I defined. And I might want you to spread out amongst those places or keep the binding close as possible within that list. And that's what close and spread mean. Uh, <clears throat> and here's a little example. So I'm, I'm not, this is an example of a hybrid, of an application that has multi-level parallelism because OMP threads has a, num threads has a comma in it. And it has two levels of parallelism. So you would have decomposition to one thread team for one loop potentially, and then an inner loop decomposed to another thread team. And that's just an example showing a, that you can control the binding this way. So it's the kind of thing I think if you're using the KNL nodes and you're using not the latest Intel compiler, then it, it, it might be an option to use rather than trying to work out exactly what the correct app run command is. We do have web pages explaining how to use the, app, the correct app run command. So, so, th so then the last thing on compilers is CC 8.7 was released in, in April. So that's the latest Cray compiler. So this is two newer than the current default on Archer. So I'll just men so that will be in probably installed in the next month or two. It might be July. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen. Uh, so what you can expect from this is that the floating point optimization level for the Mo3 has gone up one. Uh, Fortran now has more features coming from Fortran 2008. And I've got a slide on that, so I'll mention that in a second. C++ now does much more aggressive inlining. Many C++ codes have a lot of include files, you know, mainly due to templates. So the IPA option stands for interprocedural analysis. So this has been bumped up for C++, so it's much more aggressive at doing that, which is a really a performance thing. The other thing that's coming are the intrinsics for C11. So those were an optional part of the standard. So so the, the CC 8.7 supports those, and it, and it supports some new OpenMP environment variables, uh, or, or rather, it supports things you can set those variables to that are slightly different, which I'll mention. Uh, so, and these are those two things, which is you can now set OMP prop bind to auto, which means that the OpenMP implementation will automatically do binding if it's not already set. So if you'd launch something without specifying binding from AppRun, this would automatically do it for you via the OpenMP implementation. And then the other thing, and these are Cray extensions. So the other one is for the weight policy. So OMP weight policy defines how a thread waits for extra work. So that's what would happen at the end of a parallel loop. So you can either spin weight, which eats up CPU time, or you can kind of park the thread and not do anything. But the second option is more expensive when you wake up again. So you, you basically want to have 
passive waiting if uh, if you're not oversubscribed sorry if you're oversubscribing because you if you were spinning all those threads and you've oversubscribed then you're going to start to affect something that does real computation with a thread that should be idle so this is this is an attempt to make the default sensible you know so and for you not to shoot yourself in the foot by oversubscribing and not realizing that the OpenMP implementation is going to spend all this time spinning threads that aren't doing real work for you. So those are a couple of changes. Now for Fortran, you know, we're, we're getting there with the next Fortran standard. It, it was called Fortran 2015. And when it looks like we're going to be more than two or three years away, they changed the name. So it's now called Fortran 2018. And CCE supports most of the co array uh, definitions in that standard. Uh, so there was a, there was a, there were co-array features that were delayed from uh, Fortran 20, uh, 2008, which eventually were published in a technical specification, which are now part of the full standard. So some of those features are there, like events. The other thing that's there is co-shape. I know David Tenty from EPCC was interested in that one, and in fact that was an example of a feature request that came in that went to the standards committee, and they were they actually decided that the use case was important enough that they added the intrinsic. Uh, there's there's a whole interoperability uh, specification, and these and what this allows you to do is to pass Fortran objects into C, and then on the C side inquire about those Fortran objects. So you could pass a multi-dimensional strided object to C, and then there are C routines that enable you to find out where that object starts and precisely what striding it is. Okay, so I'm told about my sound cut out. So I was just going to say that the there, there are two major chunks of, of uh, work that's gone into the Fortran uh, 2018 and the compiler. One is the co-array options, and the other one is interoperability with with uh, with C. And what that allows you to do is to pass an n-dimensional Fortran object into C, find out what type it is, find out how it's strided in memory, and then operate on it in the C on the in the C program. And that's actually a requirement to do a proper implementation of an interoperability with MPI. Because currently what MPI historically has just relied on passing a buffer and having no understanding of the Fortran object that was passed to C. So, and, and I've written a, a list of the things that are currently available in the, the 8.7 compiler. So events are, are a nice thing. So events are a co-array feature that are single-sided synchronization. To date, although the co-array PGAS model is single-sided, the actual synchronization was two-sided, which was a bit annoying. So events allow you to have a single-sided synchronization. Uh, and some things are actually deleted in the standard. So you'll be glad to know that common and equivalence, you know, arithmetic if have, have gone. The compiler didn't actually delete them because they weren't brave enough, but you'll get a warning message now if you use some of these features. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go through the rest of this list. There's a whole range of things. Uh, and so I, I've, and once the standard is published, there'll be a race to make sure that everything is, is done. So, so that's really the, the chunk on compilers, a quick section on message passing, and then a section on the, on the oh, sorry, a section on performance tools and the message passing. So, so the Cray performance tools are designed at running very large scale performance experiments. So, and we know this works on ex extremely high scale. And, and there have been various ways to use these tools in the past. The easiest way to use them today is to load a module called Perf Tools Lite. Uh, so you load a module called Perf Tools Base that gets the commands in your path. If you load Perf Tools Lite and do a compilation and then run your application, you'll get a report once you run the application. That you get a report to standard output. And there are other ways to use the module, the Perf Tools tools by specifically building an application for particular types of profile, collecting the performance data, and then running something called Pat Report or Apprentice, which is the GUI side of this. So th that's the basics of, of, of how the performance tools work. But the, there's been some changes, I would say, since 646, which is uh, one of the previous modules on Archer. So the first thing that changed was there's now a, all of the output files are collected into one directory. And when you run Pat Report, you can run it on the whole directory. The other improvement has been the processing time of the reports when you have run something on large numbers of nodes for a long time, because sometimes that processing could take a lot. You know, it could take an hour to do the processing. That's if you run something on you know, a thousand nodes for hours. So it, it, that that was a bit of a problem. So the, the, there are some of this processing can happen in parallel now. Uh, and in the future, the, the the base module, which is what gets you the commands in your path, will be loaded by default. That's currently not the case on Archer.
and the latest releases of they always change the support for libraries and they've added new wrappers for new features in in netcdf uh, and, and and the other thing i think is really nice is that the next pair of tools so when we next do an installation on archer it has the ability to profile a dynamically linked application just by running it you don't need to pre-compile it in any special way so there's a new command called pat run which is essentially an intercept command that you you so you run pat run and you give it the arguments you would normally give your program along with potentially some arguments for telling it how to do the profiling uh, and this in this finally will enables us to trace applications like open foam that were really a problem before both because they were completely dynamically linked and because they loaded mpi dynamically so uh, that's a quite interesting useful new capability potentially quite useful for isv applications where you have no chance of recompiling them so I'm quite keen to try this. Now, just be aware that this binary does exist on Archer today. If you load the, the, the release from December 2017, there is a perf tool 700 that's got pat run in it, but that was really a kind of alpha pre-release. So it, if you want to try this feature, I'd wait until the 701 appears. Um, and, I'll and I think when we install that, I'll maybe try to get an a, a, a note included in an Archer mailing about the fact that that's been in been installed because we don't necessarily say when non uh, when that happens you know we, we tend not to make an announcement of that uh, so the other thing they've added is profiling for memory traffic and 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 breaking out uh, memory traffic per NUMA domain so here's an example of a new table and I don't know how easy it is for you to read this because it's not readable on my screen but essentially if you can see this it's broken out communication traffic in megabytes per second uh, Oh, sorry, gigabytes per second to each NUMA node. So that's a way to tell if you've got some imbalance in the memory access. Of course, in the end, you don't really want memory. You want everything to be cached. So you kind of want this number to be small. Um, and you'd use other tables in the performance report to see if you were utilizing your caches properly or not. But that's you know a, a new feature that they've added. Uh, and for the last little section, I'll mention MPI. So uh, the, M the MPT software, the message passing toolkit software includes MPI and Shamem. And this quite often the release notes for MPI mentions performance improvements. So for the Shamem implementation, one thing that Shamem had was it, it had collective operations, but they were kind of based on power of two decompositions. So this has become much more general. The other feature that's, so for MPI, the Cray implementation now supports some of the dynamic process management features. So this enables you to have two completely separate applications that can communicate via MPI. And I know that various people have asked about this in the past. And so I'd be quite interested, if someone's really interested in exploring this, get in touch with me through the help desk or uh, because I think we have to make a small configuration change to Archer to make this work. So if, if that's something you're interested in, uh, get in touch and we'll, we'll look into it. Uh, and the other thing to mention is that when you use these dynamic process management features, you link with a different version of MPI. So if you type man M intro underscore MPI, it mentions this support and it tells you how to change your link line. But that other library allows much larger numbers of tags and communicators. So occasionally we get people that have applications that use enormous numbers of tags or they use 10,000 communicators and they fail. And we go, why did you write a code like that? And they go, just because we did, right? And it's a pain. So it just so happens that because of the way this library was implemented, it has increased the space. And it's not for free because the static allocation of that space means that the MPI implementation has to do a little bit more work. But uh, that might be an option for people who've had problems before with hit, you know, hitting the limit of the number of tags that's available. Uh, you can actually inquire what the limit is for tags, but there's no standard way to inquire what it is for communicators. Uh, the other thing, they continually try to improve a couple of areas. They try to improve the performance of single-sided remote memory operations, uh, and in particularly the th from threading applications. So uh, if you use MPI thread multiple and you have multiple threads calling MPI, I, it really would be worth trying the absolute latest MPI. And some of these performance improvements were driven by KNL because obviously you, for KNL you might be running uh, either a large number of processes or a very large number of threads, and that reveals two things: one, you need thread scalability, and the other thing you need is crucial areas of the MPI implementation that depend on serial performance to be really good. 
because any any problem with SEO performance will be revealed by KNL because its SEO performance isn't great. So a range of improvements went in there. So anyone trying single-sided experiments, I recommend you try the latest one. And there there have also been other app other improvements like an, an improved algorithm to match messages on the receive side. We've already seen applications improved. That's just straight point-to-point -point optimization. The other thing, which is a combination of MPI and perf tools, is that you can now create via perf tools uh, a rank reordering list that's based on your specific placement in the machine. Now, I'm not sure how useful that is because you'd have to run with the same placement. So it may be you have an application where this is so valuable that you'd be prepared to take the hit of doing an experiment to work out what that placement is and then immediately do a run. You know, that's essentially what you'd have to do. There already is the ability to look at the communication pattern in an application and, gain, and get a new rank reordering list that you then pass into MPI via an environment variable or from a file. Uh, but that's not topology aware. That's, that's basically looking at the, uh, what it thinks the decomposition strategy is in your application, trying to infer what that is and then build a reasonable rank reordering for it. And the other thing is that MPIO has some improvements for writes that are quite small. So MPIO does aggregation of small writes and they've they've improved some of that. And then just some other random things. Uh, if there are Cray modules for R and Python that are compatible with the rest of the environment, that that's only only available on CLE 6. There are various improvements to, improvements to the scientific libraries that come along uh, and the, the large packages that come as parts of those libraries. And, and looking a bit further into the future, there's a new feature coming in Lustre that will enable, which will allow better performance for shared file access. At the moment, that's limited by some locking that Lustre does. So it'll improve that use case, but it, it needs new, a new, it would need a new Lustre installation, you know, a new update to Lustre. So I, I don't know if and when that might happen, but that's a one to watch. So, so. So I, I've kind of done what I wanted to do, and I realize it's a mass of little details which you may or may not be interested in. Like I said, I think the, the talk will, I'll, I'll make it available to an, any Archer users who are interested in it, and you can look at the webinar again uh, on the web. And, and the final thought, which is if, if you have problems and you think, you know, there's a, a bug in the environment or there's a bug uh, in the builds, you know, and there's a bug, bug in the way that all these modules work together and that stops your build working, then try to switch to a new module, because quite often, problems might already be fixed. That's particularly likely for a compiler problem. So, you know, switch to a newer compiler right out. You, uh, and uh, just be aware you might need to switch more than one thing. Uh, and the other thing is if you have a problem with an actual build, so say you try to build something and you get some error that looks like the wrong version of a library has been included, there's a, there's a module called Cray PE which controls how that works. So you could switch that module. Or in fact, there's a modules module which you can switch, but doing that is not so trivial because it's part of your environment when you log in. So you need instructions on how to do that. But th these are things you can try. Uh, obviously, just switching a minor release or something is kind of is is a trivial thing to do. And I collected a lot of this information from release notes, along with some information that the Cray developer sent me. So if if you want to see the release notes, if you type module help on a module or a specific version, you get the release notes. And it also points to the specific file on the system, which you can then just look at, you know, rather than type a module command. Uh, <clears throat> the, there is also documentation on the, 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 the Cray documentation website, which is called pubs.cray.com. For various large packages, there are intro man pages that tell you things. So specifically for perf tools. And, MPI is a useful one because there's a, a huge number of environment variables that control MPI. And some of those optimizations I told you about, when they implement the optimization, they put in a variable that lets you back out of it. So, and that will be described in the intro MPI man page. And, and, and kind of more general usage information is available from the Archer website. So that's it. I know it was, I know it was a lot, but I hope it was at least useful for some people to see what you know. There's a lot of work that goes on in the background to upgrading, you know, and updating, com, you know, compiler features, performance work that isn't really obvious to to, to many people. So it, you know, it's nice to give those guys credit from time to time.